Okay, now, before you think this is a joke, please hear me out. I'm a newly graduated medical student in a fairly small town. I was in the middle of residency, training to gain some experience and make some connections in the field, just like every other person who wanted a chance in this brutal job market. I had been shadowing psychiatry for around two years and never had I encountered a case so unforgettable that it left me questioning if I should have just become a lab technician or some other job that's not client facing. I've always respected patient confidentiality, believe me, but just this once, I have to make an exception and you'll soon see why. All the names have been changed to protect the identities of the individuals involved. Around three months ago, the psychiatrist I was working with, Dr. Kim, gave me the opportunity to try taking on a patient of my own. We worked in a small private clinic with six other doctors in a shared building. So far, she had always been in the room with me during appointments, so of course, I wanted to prove that I was ready for the challenge. She told me it was someone who got referred from their family doctor to see a specialist, like the majority of new patients. I gave the prognosis papers a quick glance. Nathan Summers, 27, male. Delusions about identity. Diagnostic impression, schizophrenia. It wasn't my first time dealing with schizophrenia before. For those who don't know, these are false beliefs that aren't based in reality. For example, you think you're being harmed or harassed, you interpret patterns in everyday objects as messages, or I guess in this case, who you even are. It was a relatively quiet day when the clinic door swung open. Footsteps could be heard approaching the receptionist table. I spent a couple of minutes gathering all the necessary paperwork and poked my head out of the office. The doctor will be right with you. Please come this way, said the receptionist. Some muffled chatter approached behind the door. That was my cue. Nathan, I called out into the hall. Expecting a man, a short woman with dried out brunette hair and dark circles walked in. Her brows were furrowed and her eyes filled with desperation like she was on the verge of tears. I I'm Rita, his wife, she said wryly. Her lips wrinkled the smallest attempt of a smile as she reached out her hand. Pleasure to meet you, Rena. I'm your doctor, I said while I shook her hand. Trailing in behind her was who I assumed was her husband. He was wearing a six-foot-tall mascot suit of sorts that was the splitting image of Garfield. Look, initially, I laughed too. Not out loud, but in my head when I saw the goofy costume. I thought this had to be a joke. Maybe Dr. Kim was setting me up to see if I could detect bullshit and this was my true test of knowledge. Either way, I was intrigued. The man's orange and white fur was matted and filthy, and covered in food stains and the smell. Let's just say I felt slight regret at that moment of accepting the case. Nonetheless, I wasn't going to turn away anyone who came for help and it certainly wasn't my place to judge someone. I knew firsthand that mental illness can really put you in a bind for hygiene and personal care. That was part of the reason I studied psychiatry in the first place. I wanted to help others who were in a similar position as myself. I smiled at the two and gestured for them to take a seat. And you must be Nathan, I asked the man in his suit as his wife lowered him into the chair with her guidance. Why do people keep... The woman quietly muttered. He's not talking right now. She answered, her lower lip quivering. Oh? He refused to talk ever since he started doing this. I see. I nodded. I guess that's why she had to come in with him. It would be a little challenging without communicating with the patient directly, but I guess it couldn't be helped. That's not a problem. I said, trying to reassure the wife. Reno, why don't you tell me what the problem is and how it all started? Her hands were clasped tightly together as she exhaled deeply. 
<sighs> Around one month ago, my husband came home and started saying that he had a new identity. Garfield? I asked. Yeah. The bulbs of tears around Rena's eyes grew bigger. He stopped responding to his name. I thought it was a prank at first that he and his friends were pulling on me. But it isn't. No, he's been doing this for weeks. You've been wearing this suit for weeks, Nathan. I looked at him with concern. Rena shook her head. That's not... Right, I remembered. You're not talking. Wasn't Garfield able to talk? I thought he did in some of those 3D movies years ago, but maybe that was a dream. He won't eat or shower. I begged him. He said he can't do it anymore. I just want my husband back. He hasn't showered? That would explain the putrid, rotting smell radiating from him. When was the last time he ate? I asked. Probably three weeks ago, right before the delusion started. Right. And I even tried giving him lasagna. Lasagna? Garfield's favorite? She clarified, and catching her falling tears with the sides of sleeves. I gave her a tissue as I flipped to a new page in my binder. The thought of him living in his own filth inside that damp suit was sickening. I genuinely considered the possibility that maybe this was all just an elaborate trick and this woman was an Academy Award winning actor. What would drive someone to do something like this? Has he ever had any history of mental illness or similar behavior? I asked. I had his case file from his family doctor open on my desk already, but maybe she knew something else since they were in a relationship. N not that I know of. I, I mean, we we've been together for five years. He has days where he's sad, but, like, nothing serious like depression. I'm the one who overthinks, honestly. And she released a tiny chuckle. I see. I looked over at Nathan, who sat as still as a statue next to her. I was hoping her distress would cause him to open up, but to no avail. She was right. Looking at his case file, this guy was as healthy as a horse. Optimal blood sugar levels, good heart and liver, no family history of schizophrenia either. If that's even what we were dealing with here. I, I think this is partly my fault though, she said, rubbing her temples with her palm. Her tears started to well up again. Why do you say that? I praise him a lot and he doesn't like that. He doesn't like being praised. Can you please elaborate? I, I know it's weird, but 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 it's humble and doesn't like it when people praise him. He says it's not who he is and that I'm lying to him. I see. My interest peaked. Can you give an example? Well, sometimes, if I tell him that I'm proud of him, or like, you look good today, he gets angry and denies it. That's very interesting. I jotted down some notes in my binder. I, I, I don't think... I, I think he's... I think he thinks he's not living up to people's expectations of him. Like, he's trying to prove he's not who I think he is. But I know that's because he put such high expectations on himself. And I don't need that. I just need for him to be himself, you know? Maybe he's trying to break free from constantly living up to others' expectations. His wife clearly supports him, but maybe it's from his family or work. Definitely some external factors at play here. Was he truly delusional, or was this just an act for attention? I definitely don't think this is your fault in any way, I said. Thanks, she said quietly, seeming to not quite believe my words. In rare cases, a sudden onset of schizophrenia could happen without trauma. Besides, we need him to tell us himself and shouldn't jump to conclusions. Is there something in his life that changed one month ago that might have triggered him? Like a job change, death in the family, stuff like that? Rena shook her head. No, not that I can think of. 
This was running into a dead end. Without Nathan being willing to talk, there was no way to get to the bottom of it. I turned to Nathan slowly. Can you please talk to us? The man's head turned, but there was no nod. Only a slight grunt came out. The meshed eye holes were black and unending, perfectly concealing what was behind it. The lazy but smug facial expression of Garfield permanently plastered on his face as he turned his head. Part of me was afraid that there wasn't even a person in there. I said again, Your wife is very worried about you and we just want to know what's going on. Did something happen to you a month ago? Nathan slowly nodded. I felt both excited and terrified. I continued, can you let us know what happened? I want to help you. The costumed man slowly raised an arm towards his head, drawing small circles. Rena tensed up in her seat as did I, trying to interpret his actions. I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. Is that a circle? He shook his head, instead patting to the top of the mascot head with his hand. Your head? I asked. He nodded, and my heart skipped a beat. Is there something wrong with your head? He nodded again, faster and harder. I turned back to Rima. Do you know what's wrong with his head? He went on a fishing trip with his friends about a month ago. She shifted in her seat. He slipped and hit the back of his head on some rocks, but it wasn't a serious injury. Oh, wait, how serious was it? I asked, leaning forward in my chair. I thought it was strange that she didn't bring this up earlier, as it seemed pretty significant given the timing. Like, just a bump on his scalp. It, it, it didn't bleed or anything. He was back up in minutes, according to his friends. Maybe the injury was more serious than you thought, I suggested. She paused, seeming to realize her mistake. Oh, God, you're right. That, that, that didn't even occur to me. There was only one thing that I could do. I turned once again to the suited man, the lifeless black mesh staring deeply into my soul, concealing any facial expressions he had. Was he content? Angry? What was he feeling right now? No one could tell. Can you please remove your mascot head? I asked, trying my best to sound calm despite how anxious I was becoming myself. I, I want to examine your head from your fishing trip. Is that all right? He shook his head. I took a deep breath and adjusted my tone. I felt like I was talking to a child. We just want to take a quick look. It'll only take two minutes. You can put the head back on as soon as I'm done. He shook his head again. His wife looked at him worriedly, then back at me. Oh, how badly I wanted to yank that Garfield head off of him and tell him to snap the hell out of it. The musty stench of the suit was now dominating the room, irritating my nose even through my mask. But a part of me was also terrified of what was under his head. A man who hadn't properly showered or eaten for weeks. I couldn't imagine what horrible state he would be in. What if Nathan wasn't even the one inside there? Had Rena even seen him without the costume on? Legally, I couldn't remove his mascot head without his consent. It was part of his clothing, but maybe... Rena, I said, can you please take the mascot head off of your husband? I asked, but it was more of a demand at this point. I... Rena shot me a panicked look. Her hands flew to her chest in defense. I don't know if that's a good idea. Wouldn't that hurt him? I took a deep breath, and I had a feeling she would be hesitant. <sighs> I know, but we can't help him this way. I'd rather someone he knows and trusts like you do it, or else we'll have to take him to the hospital. And the hospital may likely use force. Marina dipped her head down, her fingers fumbling around in her lap. She let out a deep breath before raising her head to meet mine. Okay, she said, her voice trembling with fear. I, I, 
I'll do it. The woman stood up from her chair and placed her hands on the obscenely large mascot head. I'm sorry, babe, but I'm doing this because I love you. Her arms began to pull upwards, the hole for the neck beginning to lift, revealing Nathan's neck, and then a loud crash. The, the, the next few seconds happened so fast that I barely had time to process what was even happening. Rena let out a blood-curdling scream and Nathan tackled her to the ground. Both of them hit the floor, hard. He pinned her in place while his fur-covered hands wrapped around her throat, growling, enraged. No, no, stop. I, I, I'm sorry. Rena screamed as he heaved angrily through the suit. Dark red liquid oozed from his eye and mouth holes as he squeezed the life out of her. Rena's face jerked from side to side, avoiding the blood that spewed from the costumed man. I screamed at the top of my lungs. Help, please, someone help. I swung the door open and yelled it into the hall. Rena caught violently for air. Her eyes bulged in water, the hands clawing at Nathan's grip. M my legs were shaken, and I pulled at Nathan with all my strength, but he wouldn't budge. Not even five seconds later, four people came barging through the office. Two of the doctors pulled at Nathan, yelling, Get off of her! He stumbled backwards, blood spitting out of the head, grunting and snarling like a caged animal. You hold his legs! A third man shouted. One of the patients in the waiting room pinned him down onto the floor along with the two doctors. I quickly rushed to Rena, who was convulsing in cold sweat. Her face flushed a deep red. We carried her over to an adjacent room to check her vitals. Her pulse was weak, but thankfully, there. In the other room, Nathan was held face down with someone holding each of his limbs in place. All of the remaining patients in the waiting room quickly fled from the building as sirens blared in the distance. What happened? Dr. Kim exclaimed as she walked into the room looking at Rena, who was trembling on the exam table. Good question. What the hell did happen? I looked calm on the outside, but my heart was beating out of my chest. I was holding back my morning breakfast from regurgitating. He, he started choking her, was all I was able to get out as I shakily wrapped the blood pressure cuff around the poor woman laying in front of me. I don't think my first patient visit could have gone any worse than this. Are you all right? Dr. Kim asked. She didn't seem angry with me, just concerned. All things considered, yeah. That's good. The police are almost here, so don't worry, she said. Dr. Kim jumped in to help me with the checkup. We carefully examined Rena's neck and breathing. Although it would probably bruise in a few days, there was no damage to her windpipe to our relief. Rena curled up into a fetal position on the table with her hands covering her face. No, 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 no. She cried over and over again as she rocked back and forth. I stroked her back with my hand, trying to comfort her. Can I bring you some water? I asked. Was I allowed to even do this? At this point, I was kind of taken out of the doctor and patient situation and just trying to be friendly. Uh, no, I I'm fine, thanks. She answered, her face barely peeked from behind her hands. Okay, well, if you need anything, just let us know. I placed a bottle of water beside her on the table anyways, and funnily enough, she gulped down nearly the whole thing. In the adjacent room, four people kept an eye on Nathan until the police arrived. All the while, he struggled against the people that were pinning him in place on the ground. You could still hear him grunting and growling with rage even through two closed doors. When the front doors finally swung open, everyone breathed a sigh of relief. The police quickly detained Nathan. Seeing Garfield in handcuffs shoved into the back of a squad car was surreal. If I saw a photo of this online, I would laugh, but this was the terrifying reality that I had just witnessed. The police gave us their card and said that it would take some time to get back to us. They initially wanted to detain Rena too, just for questioning, but seeing the condition she was in, they decided it was probably best to do it another day. As the police car diminished down the road, 
I felt like I could finally calm down. Nathan was out of the building. Dr. Kim apologized profusely for giving me this patient, but I felt like I should have apologized for asking the wife to remove his mascot head. We both felt like we were responsible. I took a mandatory week off. I say mandatory because I didn't choose it. The property manager had to sanitize the blood spills on the floor, and Dr. Kim said it would be beneficial for everyone to take a well-needed break just to collect ourselves. The free week flew by and work resumed like normal, but it was in the back of everyone's minds. Needless to say, we were all still very shaken up by the incident. This never made national headlines, but everyone in the clinic watched the local news like a hawk. I don't care what his crime was, I just needed to know if they managed to get him out of the damn Garfield suit and what he looked like under there. Everyone had the same sentiment. We waited a week, then two, then three, and then a month went by with no updates from the police. Three months passed by until we finally got word of the verdict. Investigators revealed that Nathan did indeed go on a fishing trip that day a month ago, but it wasn't with his friends. In fact, his friends thought he was out of the country because they hadn't heard from him for over a month. He was alone near the lake fishing when an unseen perpetrator caused blunt force trauma to his head. As for removing the Garfield suit, it was a strenuous ordeal. 82 stitches had to be carefully cut to remove the first suit that was sewn directly into his skin with fishing wire. His wounds were infected with gangrene and festering with pus, including his eyes and lips that prevented him from talking. And yeah, it was Nathan Summers inside that suit, with his skin slowly rotting away. When they searched their house, it clearly belonged to a fanatic. It was filled brim to brim with Garfield paraphernalia, plushies, dishware, toiletries, you name it. Inside one of the drawers was a marriage certificate that read, Garfield and Rena Tamwood, that was obviously edited. They found a closet with several mascot costumes that were identical to the one Nathan wore and the same kind of fishing wire used to attach him to the suit. That wasn't a huge surprise, considering what we had witnessed, except Rena was the one shown in handcuffs. Her mugshot photo with her crispy brown hair and solemn expression flashed across the TV screen. Thinking back on their visit that day three months ago, it occurred to me that not once had she referred to her husband as Nathan. <sighs> I don't think I'm going to work as a psychiatrist anymore.